because, Father, we know your love never fails. Your love never runs out on us, Lord. If anything, Lord, it's us that run out on you, Lord. It's us, Lord, that leaves you. You never leave us nor forsake us, Father. You're always there for us. And, Lord, even though we take a thousand steps away from you, Lord, Father, it's only one step back to you. Father, you loved us so much that you'd rather die than live without us. And so, Lord, tonight, may, there may be some here that are taking that one step back to you, Lord. We are very thankful. We are very grateful. And, Father, that even in our lives and our relationship, Father, you desire for us to have going to deal with you every day, one-on-one, -on -one, an intimate relationship. Father, we don't need anybody else, Lord. All we need is you, Lord. All we need is your love. In our lives, working through our lives, that you may be glorified. Father, we thank you and we praise you. We give you all honor and all glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. All God's children said, amen, amen. amen. How you guys doing? Bless, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Go ahead and have a seat. It's great to be here with you guys tonight. It's definitely an honor and a privilege to be here with you. I'm excited. Tonight we're going to be turning our Bibles to Judges chapter 9. Judges chapter 9. So if you'd like to please turn your Bibles with me to Judges chapter 9. We're going to be looking at the rise and the fall of Abimelech tonight. I would say also Judges chapter 8. We're going to, go and start off there, looking at verses 33 to 35, and then we're going to go into chapter 9. Even as we think about the book of Judges, we are halfway through the book of Judges in the story without a judge. Chapter 9 follows the tragic legacy of a man God once called Mighty. As we saw last week, Gideon's life went from Zero to hero, back to zero. A picture of unfaithfulness that characterized judges as a whole, as a book. As flawed as all judges are, God uses these broken men to save a broken people in a broken world at a broken time. It is hard to tell whether Gideon is good, bad, or both. He starts so well, and yet he ends off Poorly. Gideon responded to God's call, talked with God faithfully, tore down the altar, and battled the Midianites, and yet he refuses the crown, but then he acts like a king. His success makes him prideful, as we saw that last week, which led him to, to the abuse of his own people, to the abuse of God's people. Then he makes an ephod, dir directing all worship toward himself and centering all worship around his family in Orpah, as we saw last week. Not in the invisible God, dwelling in the tabernacle of Shiloh, he became the first celebrity pastor, and the ephod became a snare to his family. All men have the desire to be great. This is part of the image of God in us. That desire is good when men remember who God is. And we celebrate what he has done. And we obey what he says. And in that, it leads others to delight in his ways. Yet, that desire is bad when men forget who God is and what he has done. And what we do is we decide how to think and feel or what is right or what is wrong. And we do what we want to do. And then God becomes somewhat of a genie in a bottle for us. For whatever the situation calls for, we, we call on God. Rather than just relying upon him every day, every minute, every breath that we take, every move that we make, that we follow the Lord. Amen. And we decide how, how we feel and what we want to do. Even, even as we think about Genesis, right? Adam and Eve, our parents, they decided they wanted to be like God. They wanted to be worshipped, to reign without challenge. And yet here, the book of Judges shows us how all men, even God's best, God's best, think about that, God's best are tempted to sit on God's throne. Though they won't admit it, as we've been looking at the role of a pastor, 
the, the responsibility of a pastor. We, we saw that even on Sunday. We need to be very careful. We don't take any glory from the Lord. As leaders of our homes, of our communities, of our jobs, wherever we find ourselves, we need to be really careful. Because even as we won't admit it, sometimes we don't even see it. Even as Gideon never lives to see the full impact of his dark legacy, a bad man, bad dad, bad leader. You see, every single one of us have a legacy that we're going to leave. And the reality is it's not how you start, it's how you finish that matters most to God. What legacy are you going to leave behind? A bad man? A bad dad, mom, whatever it may be, a bad leader? It plays out in the next generation. Let's go and look here at uh, Judges chapter 8, verse 33, and let's read and see again the ending of Gideon's life. And so it was, as soon as Gideon was dead, the legacy that he left, it says that the children of, of Israel again played the harlot with Baals and made Baal bear it their God. Thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord, their God, who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. Nor did they show kindness to the house of Jeroboam, Gideon, in accordance with the good he had done for Israel. Immediately we see, following his death, we see a new cycle of sin is launched as the people's faith is revealed as dependent upon Gideon was their king, not Jesus Christ. You see, whenever you put your trust in your eyes on men, they will let you down. we got to keep our eyes on the Lord. Now, has God raised up some great men? Has God used men to do some great things? Amen. You see, God has chosen to work through men or women to reach people. But doesn't mean we worship the man. Why? Because we're just tools in the master's hand. Every single one of us are instruments being used by God. So what happens here with the children of Israel? They run back to Baals. And this time they adopt a hybrid of uh, Judaism called uh, Baal Bert, meaning Lord of the Covenant. This was a religion using biblical language mixed with paganism like Mormonism. And the more they loved Baal, the more they forgot Yahweh. The more they started to fall into the ways of the world, the more they forgot about God and the ways of the Lord. And the more they became to hate the Lord the more they begin to hate Gideon's family. No one hates Gideon more than his uh, illegitimate son. Yet he wants to be just like him. We see this here in chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. The rise of the king of Abimelech. We see Gideon had a problem. Nowhere in the Bible, and we saw this last week, does God ever permit you to have multiple women? Matter of fact, the Bible says that God created man and, and woman, but yet two shall become one, right? And be joined together. Nowhere did we ever see that it was right for a, a man to have multiple wives. And what did Gideon do? He took on multiple wives. And it says he had 70, uh, 70 sons. And here Abimelech is from, right, uh, one of those women. And so we see here, looking at chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Then Abimelech, Abimelech the son of Jeroboam, we know that Jeroboam means Gideon, went to Shechem to his mother's brother, and he spoke with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, Please speak in the hearing of all the men of Shechem which is better for you, that all 70 of the sons of Jeroboam reign over you, or 
that one reign over you, remember that I am your own flesh and bone. And as his mother's brother, brother spoke all these words concerning him in the hearing of all the men of Shechem, and their hearts was inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our brother. So they gave him 70 shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Berith, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless men, and they followed him. Then he went to his father's house at Orpah. And what did he do? He killed his brothers. The, the 70 sons of Jeroboam on one stone. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left because he hid himself. And all the men of Shechem gathered together, all of Beth Milo, and they went and made Abimelech king besides the terebinth tree at the pillar that was in Shechem. Wow. I, I bet you Gideon was rolling over in his grave. Right? How, you know, the Bible says that, that, that the father leaves his children inheritance. And I don't know about you guys, but when I, when I, when I think of that, I, I believe that it, it orchestrates that, yeah, we should leave our children a financial heritage. Why? Because we may get stewards of what God's given to us as fathers, as husbands. There should be an inheritance for them if we've managed God's money right. But more important than that, I believe that the heritage that I want to leave my kids is a biblical heritage. Amen? One that they can take on to the next generation. One that they can take on to their kids. And I, I think of, even now, as I have a, a Bible, I call it a family Bible, and I have gotten pap, pa, uh, Papa Chuck's autograph. I've gotten some guys that have been spiritual mentors in my life to sign the, the Bible. And every Christmas, we take that Bible, and every gift we open, we, we make sure that we outline it, whether it be blue for my son, pink for my daughter, my wife, or even myself. And we put down the date, that there, and what we do is we pick a scripture, and we go ahead and read it before we open every gift. And anybody that we may, we may have with us that, that Christmas, whether we sponsor them as a family, whatever it may be, and they're having Christmas with us, we go and put their initials on there. And we can go back to kind of see and remember uh, the Christmas or what have you. And, and that's really important, guys. The legacy that we leave as fathers to our children. And here we see you know, Gideon's family is pretty much destroyed here at this point. He had a lot of kids. He, main, main, he maintained a, a, a harem of wives in his hometown in Orpah. He also kept a, a concubine on the side in the city of Shechem, who is most likely a Canaanite. She gave birth to a son, Abimelech, who she named, and Abimelech means, my father is king. And raised in Shechem with, with visits from dad every weekend, with the name, you know, my father is king, my daddy is king, has serious daddy wounds. He feels abandoned. He feels rejected. He is not happy. He believes that he deserves more. It's important that we stay true to our children, to our wives. It's important that we we, we're the man of one wife because these are the consequences that we deal with. These are the things that we're seeing in single mother homes when, without a father in a home. The, the, the reactions, the backlashes in our community. And here, Abimelech is a perfect example of what happens with the wounded heart of a man. Abimelech appeals to his relatives and his, his clan who, if they were faithful men and women, would have told him to stop. But what do they do? They encourage him in his sin and appeal to the leaders of Shechem, literally the Baals. They don't stop him either. And Abimelech appeals to, to the same desires to be great. And the argument is simple. Which is better for you is what he lays out. Which is better for you, them or me? I am your brother. It is better to be rude, uh, uh, ruled by a family of 70 
Baal fighters from another city or one Baal worshiper, a homeboy like myself. Why do false teachers succeed? People support strong leaders, ministers, who tell them what they want to hear, usually with a just enough Jesus sprinkle on it in to make it convincing. They agree to finance his anti-God campaign to destroy Gideon's family here. The funds come from a cultic temple. 70 shekels of silver was given to kill 70 men, valuing each man's life worth about five to ten dollars of today's money. That's really what, it, what, they, what, he, what they paid to kill each son of Gideon. Abimelech hires these, these, these uh, it says these uh, mercenaries, these travelers, these orphans, who slaughters 69 of his 70 half-brothers with one stone. And just as Gideon restored relation with Yahweh through sacrifice, his son now restores worship to Baal through human sacrifice. His own sons, his own brothers. This is half of Gideon's legacy. But like Gideon, Abimelech attempts or accepts the honor of being Israel's first king. A sure sign of sinful, ambitious leader, leadership is a pile of bodies, people who are worthless, are usually those who want to be great for their own glory. What do they do? They begin by destroying their own family. We see an example of bad leadership. We see an example of why when we have the opportunities like this last week when we get to go vote, right? We can go vote in some great leaders to lead our, to lead our cities, to lead our, you know, our state, to lead our country. And we are living in a time, as we look at America, of bad leadership. You can make it and say what you want to say. You can blame it on what have you, what have you. But as leaders, we must take ownership. That's why we are leaders. Leaders don't point fingers. Amen? Leaders take ownership. Leaders take responsibility. We see here, moving on, in verse 7, the parable of Jotham. He says, Now when they told Jotham, he went and stood on the top of Mount Gerzim, and lifted his voice and cried out. And he said to them, Listen to me, you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. The tree once went forth to anoint a king over them. And they said to the olive tree, Reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, Should I cease giving my oil, with which they honor God and men, and go to sway over trees? Then the tree said to the fig trees, You come and reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, Should I cease my sweetness and my good fruit and go to sway over trees? Then the tree said to the fig tree, You come and you reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, Should I cease my sweetness and my good fruit and go sway over trees? Then the tree said, verse 12, to the vine, you come and you reign over us. But the vine said to them, Should I cease my new wine, which cheers both God and men, and go to sway over trees? Then all the trees said to the, the bramble, You come and you reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, If in truth you anoint me as king over you, then come and take shelter in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Verse 16. Now therefore, if you have acted in truth and in sincerity in making Abimelech king, and if you have dealt well with Jerubbabel and his house, and have done to him as he deserves, for my father fought for you, risked his life, and delivered you out of the hands of the Medians. But you have risen up against my house this day. 
And you killed his 70 sons on one stone. And you made Abimelech, the son of, a, of his female servant, king over the men of Shechem, because he is your brother. If then you have acted in truth and in sincerity with Jeroboam and with his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and Beth Milo. And let fire come from the men of Shechem and from Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran away and fled. And he went to Beer and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech and his brother. We see the parable of Jotham. Who was, who was Jotham? He was Gideon's youngest son, Jotham. His name means the Lord has integrity. That's what his name means. The Lord has integrity. He does what he says, doesn't he? Jotham inherited all that was right with Gideon. Like his dad, he is weak and he is small. Like his dad, he stands up when it is unpopular and it is very dangerous. And like his dad, he is also used as a tool for God's judgment. As they are celebrating this, this cardinal king, Jotham stands on the mountain where Joshua had renewed the covenant, called for a commitment, and placed on the, uh, on the mountaintop here in verse 7 to 21, he calls out the men of Shechem with a fable about trees and thorn bushes. The parable is not about the office of leadership, but it is about the character of leadership. How important it is for us, as we talked about in Timothy this last Sunday, about the character of a, of a godly leader and how important it is for us to be men above reproach, to be men of no blame, to be men of integrity, to be men of character. Because the reality is the deeds that you do become habits. Be careful. Because habits will become character. And character will become your destiny. Character will become who you are. We see here, he's talking about character in a leader. And Abimelech is not the one being challenged. Who's being challenged? While well, Israel is facing judgment for whom they have foolishly selected as king. The leaders, our followers, are held responsible for their choices. As I talked about on Sunday, as a pastor, seven times greater accountability than the average parishioner that walks in these doors. As leaders of our homes, men, guess what? We have a bigger responsibility. We have a greater responsibility for the choices that we make than our wives and our children. Whatever role of leadership you have, much is given, much is required. See, they have chosen to support a worthless, unqualified, big-talking, bramble king. And he tells him he will be a thorn to Israel. I want to encourage you. Be careful who you follow. Be careful who you follow. Because they'll lead you right off a cliff if you're not careful. Tell me who your friends are, I'll tell you who you are. Be careful who you let influence you. Be, be careful of the people in the world and celebrities that you let influence you. Because the reality is, they're no different than, than worshiping Baal or what have you. We need to worship God. We need to worship Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We need to fly the banner of Christianity. But he tells him here, again, that he will be a thorn to Israel and they will consume and be consumed by one another with fire. Unqualified leaders always lead to destruction. 
as we've seen that, and, and we're not going to name names here, but, but we've seen that over and over again. Unfaithful decisions making always, can always lead us to destructions. Unwillingness to repent always leads us to destruction. We see here, going on to verse 22, the rebellion against Abimelech and his leadership. It says, after Abimelech had reigned over Israel for how long? Three years. Three years. Three years. God sent a spirit of what? Ill will. Ill will between Abimelech and the man of Shechem. You know, the Bible says, take heed lest you fall. <laughs> you know God's in control. Amen. We think we're in control. Do you realize that? Do you, you realize how small we are? Have you ever looked at the universe? Have you ever, you ever looked at the sun? Have you ever looked at the, the, the multiple planets that are bigger than the sun? Do you know that if we were just that much, just a little bit closer to the sun, we would all melt? If we were just a little bit further from the sun, we would all, what, freeze? It's amazing how the earth turns, even as we're sitting here. <laughs> and, and, and we think we're in control. We see God doing what God does best. Staying true to his word. After Abimelech had reigned over Israel three years, God sent a spirit of ill will between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And the men of Shechem dwelt treacherously with, with Abimelech. That the crime done to the 70 sons of Jeroboam might be settled and their blood be laid on Abimelech, their brother, who killed them and on the men of Shechem, who aided him in the killing of his brothers. And the men of Shechem sent men in ambush against him on the, on the tops of the mountain. And they robbed all who passed by them along the way. And it was told Abimelech. Now Gaul, the son of Eben, came with his brothers and went over to Shechem. And the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. So they went out into the field. And let's just stop right there for a second. But isn't that how we are as men, as women? Again, here comes the, most, here comes the, new, the, the newest, latest, greatest fad on the scene. Right? Doll. And all of a sudden, we got to go get it. We got to have it. Because it's popular. And there we go again. One from one man to another. <clears throat> now Gaal, the son of Ebed, came with his brothers and went over to Shechem, and the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. Where did they go wrong? Again, putting their confidence in a man. <clears throat> Never put your confidence in a man. Put your confidence in God. Put your confidence in Jesus Christ. Because men will let you down. But God will never let you down. Amen. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So, they went out into a field and gathered grapes and there from their vineyard, vineyards and trod, and trod them and made merry. And they went into the house of their God and ate, and they drank, and they cursed Abimelech. Then God, the son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech? And who is Shechem? That we should serve him. Is he not the son of Jeroboam? And is not Zebul his offer? Serve the men of Hamar, the father of Shechem. But why should we serve him? If only these people were under my authority. Then I would remove Abimelech. So he said to Abimelech, Increase your army, and you come out. When Zebul, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gaul, the son of Ebed, his anger was aroused. And he sent messengers to Abimelech secretly, saying, Take note, Gaal, the son of Ebed, and his brothers have come to Shechem, and here they are, fortifying the city against you. Now therefore get up by night and get up by night you and your people who are with you and lie in wait in the field 
And it shall be as soon as the sun is up in the morning that you shall rise early and rush upon the city. And when he and the people who are with him come out against you, you may then do to them as you find opportunity. So Abimelech and all the people who were with him rose by night and lay in wait against Shechem in four companies. When, the, when Gaul, the son of Ebed, went out and stood in the entrance to the city gate, Abimelech and the people who were with him rose from lying in wait. And when Gaul saw the people, he said to Sembul, Look, people are coming down from the top of the mountains. But Zebu said to him, You see the shadows of the mountains as if they were men. So Gaal spoke against and said, See, people are coming down from the center of the land, and another company is coming from, from the uh, Devonir Terebith tree. Let's just go ahead and stop right there. What do we see here? We see the rebellion. We see a rebellion taking, uh, uh, taking place against Abimelech. In time, Jotham's curse, we see, comes true by the hand of the invisible God. After three years, God sends division between Abimelech and those who made him king. Division is always the first sign of self-destruction. Amen? I'm going to find a verse here. I think it's important, it just came to me right now that we see these things because if it's important to the Lord, it needs to be important to us. And that is in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 to 19. We get to see the importance of six things that God hates. You would say, I didn't know God hates. There's six things that God hates. And I want to encourage you with this because if God hates it, <laughs> so help you God. <laughs> Amen? If it's something that God hates, it's probably going to be something I want to know about. Because the last thing I want to do is be like Abimelech and be, you know, fighting against God. And fighting against God's vision and God's will. Especially in people's lives. And that's an area of leadership. Or even as a body of Christ, we need to be very, very careful. Very careful. What we say and what we do and how we act against God's people. You see, as a pastor, I look at you guys all as, as God's children. He died for you. So how am I supposed to treat you? Every single one of you with kid gloves. What do you mean? I liken it to when you have a baby, a brand new baby. They're like about yay big. And then they give them to you. And you're just like, oh, man. You're so cautious and you're like, you're, you're afraid because they're so fragile looking. And you're like, man, I don't even want to hold them. They're so small. Well, the reality is we got to look at each other and take care of each other with kid gloves. As a church, as a leadership, as coordinators, as ushers, as those who serve in the children's ministry, we need to treat God's people with kid gloves. He says here in Proverbs 6, 16 and 19, These things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are, a, are an abomination to him. Number one, what? A proud look. Have you ever seen a proud look? Bless you. A proud look. You've got to be very careful. A proud look. A lying tongue. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that what? Let's read it together, guys. A heart that devises wicked plans. Think about that for a moment. And then feet that are swift in running to evil. A false witness who speaks lies. And this is the one that we need to be careful. Very, very careful for. I mean, they're all 
They're all vital, but this one. Let's read it together. And one who what? And one who sows discord amongst the brethren. Wow. That means that the believer who sows discord amongst your brethren, trying to get your brethren to turn against the brethren, talking about somebody behind their back, trying to bring, trying to, to, to divide the church. You need to be, you need to be very, very careful. So help you God. And you mess with God's people. And you mess with God's church. And you mess with the vision of God. See, Abimelech's going to find that out here in a moment. When you fight against God, when you come against God's people, God will deal with you. In ways that I can only imagine. And so, if, if, if you're sowing seeds amongst brethren, if you're saying things behind people's back that aren't true, or you're adding to it, so you can have forcing your agenda... Be very careful. Take heed lest you fall. So after three years, God sent a vision amongst Abimelech, wanting to separate them from what he did to Gideon's family. They go on a mission to make his administration look bad. They set up an ambush on the mountain to rob anyone who passed by. Then Gaal moves to town, a new guy who looks like a good replacement, so the men of Shechem can still be great. And so they throw a, what do they do? They throw a house party. They throw a rave in the temple of Baal. Some of you guys don't know what that is. A disco party. Gaal gets drunk and then he gets mouthy and he begins to do what? Make the same argument that Abimelech, right, had made about the birthrights. He started to what? He started to get a bit mouthy about Abimelech, argues he should lead, he should be the leader, and uses the same birthright argument as a descendant of the founders of the city. And one of the things, and I want to encourage you, wolves breed wolves and eventually wolves attack wolves each other and eventually wolves eat wolves and there can be only one alpha dog amen and that one and only one is Jesus Christ in verse 34 as we go back Let's go and pick up at verse 37. So Gaal spoke again and said, See, the people are coming down from the center of the land, and another company is coming from the, the uh, Devonir territory. Then Zebu, Zebu uh, said to him, Where indeed is your mouth now? Homie, I'm just playing. <laughs> right? Straight out. Where's your mouth now? With which you said, Who is Abimelech that we should serve him? Are not these the people who you despise? Go out, if you will, and fight with them now. I mean, this is like straight out. <laughs> Game fight right here. <laughs> right? <laughs> Serious stuff. And then verse 42, it says, And it came about on the sixth day. Let us, yeah, I'm going to reverse it. So Gaal went out, leading the men of Shechem, and fought with Abimelech, and Abimelech, what? Chased him, and he fled from him, and many fell wounded in the very in, at the very entrance of the gate. Then Abimelech dwelt at uh, Ammon, and Zebu drove out Gaal and his brothers, so that they would not dwell in Shechem. And it came about on the next day that the people went out into the field, and they told Abimelech, <coughs> So he took his people, divided them into three companies, and lay in wait in the field. And he looked, and there, there were the people coming out of the city. And he rose against them and attacked them. Then Abimelech 
And the company that was with him rushed forward and stood at the entrance of the gate of the city. And the other two companies rushed upon all who were in the field and it killed them. So Abimelech fought against the city all that day. He took the city and he killed the people who were in it. And he demolished the city and sowed it with salt. We see Abimelech does more than just silence the challenger. He, he ensures that, they, that there will be nothing left to, be, to challenge him again. He, he destroys the lives of the men. He destroys the lives of the women and the children. Those who, those who once loved, followed, even funded him. And this is what, and, and, and I mean, basically when you see an absent-minded man, a, a blinded by self-ambition, will do when challenged. He will take you out. He will destroy any reputation. He does not care. Families, he does not care. Anything and everything that stands in his, in his way. We see, moving forward in verse 42, that it came to pass. It came about on the next day that the people went out in the field and they, were, and they told the Bibelic, so he took his people, divided them, and they laid wait in the field, and he took, and he, oh, I'm sorry, and he looked, and there were the people coming to the city, and they rose against him, they attacked him. We see that he killed everybody, just paraphrasing, picking it up at verse uh, 45. So Abimelech fought against the city all that day and he took the city, killed the people who were in it and he demolished the city and sold it with salt. Now when all the men of the tower of Shechem had heard that they, in, that they entered the stronghold of the temple of the God of Barith and it was told Abimelech that all the men of the tower of Shechem were gathered together. Then Abimelech went up to Mount Zamal Zalman and he and all the people who were with him and Abimelech took it and laid it on his shoulders then he said to the people who were with him what you have seen me do make haste and do as I have done so each of the people likewise cut down his own bought and followed Abimelech put them against the stronghold and set the stronghold on fire above them so that all the people of the tower of Shechem, what did they do? They died. About a thousand men and women. Again, we see Jotham's curse. God's judgment is half fulfilled. Abimelech, thir a thirst of greatness and, and power is what brings the complete fulfillment of God's wrath. We go on here in verse 50. It says, Then Abimelech went to uh, Th uh, Thebes, and he encamped against Thebes and took it. But there was a strong tower in the city, and all the men and women, all the people of the city, they fled there, and they shut themselves in. Then they went up to the top of the tower. So Abimelech, came as far as the tower and fought against it and he drew near the door in the tower to burn it with fire. I love this because here we're going to see the death of Abimelech. Take heed lest you fall. But verse 53 it says a certain woman <laughs> dropped an upper mile millstone on Abimelech's head. And what happened? I tell you, man, don't mess with women. <laughs> right? We saw that with Deborah. And, right? And, I mean, they don't mess around. God, yeah, we lead as men, but like I said, my, I'm the head, my wife's the neck that turns the head. <clears throat> I got to protect my head. <laughs> But a certain woman, it doesn't say her name, a certain woman dropped an upper millstone on a biblical head and crushed his skull. Could I? 
Then he called quickly to a young man, his armor bearer, and said to him, Draw your sword and kill me, lest men, may, uh, men say of me, a woman killed him. <laughs> wow. You see that? That says a lot right there. You know you ladies love it, don't you? But you just see a man full of pride. You know, machismo man. It's like this brother's already going to die, and he's just like, nah, you don't want a man to kill me. <laughs> no matter how you die, you're dead. But, you know, he, he, again, there's that, that, that pride, there, you know, and, and all that comes with it. Draw your sword and kill me, lest men say of me, a woman killed me. Again, that was his legacy. So his young man thrust him through, and he died. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man to his place. Thus God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech, which he had done to his father by killing his 70 brothers. And all the evil of the men of Shechem, God returned on their own heads. And on them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubbabah. Wow, what a chapter, huh? Abimelech kills his challengers, then, his, then he kills his supporters, then he kills their supporters. The people forgot God, first mentioned in, in the chapter, but God had not forgotten his, you know, the people of his covenant. And the question we need to ask ourselves, and whenever you read the Bible, is what can we learn from such a dark story? What can we take home tonight? I believe we can take home several things we can apply to our own life. First, the sins of men often have ever uh, lasting or lasting consequences. Do we understand that? Do we understand that? I don't, I see people trying to figure this out. The sins of men often have lasting consequences. Our sins affect everybody whether we want to believe it or not. They affect everybody. Our failures to lead in our homes, our failures to lead in our churches, our failures to lead in our communities will have a generational impact. I believe that we're, we are, as a people, seeing the effects today. Much of which for example, this Thursday, I'll be going to a community meeting that was set up because of members of our community that are angry. They're angry at our police department. They're angry at our school district. Why? Because there's a kid that decided to post a bunch of pictures with himself with a bunch of guns, guns that people shouldn't even have in their homes, in our community, in our backyard, our neighbors, and claim he's just going to shoot up the school. Did you guys read about that? Did you see that on the news? Yes. Come on, guys. we got to pay attention to what's going on in our community. This is our responsibility as the church. The Bible says what? If we, we are ambassadors, we need to be watchmen. Pastor, that's your job. So, so I was invited to this meeting to bring some peace in the community because the families are upset because the police didn't respond properly uh, and then the school didn't respond properly. And hey, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, you, you know, both sides, you have, you have an argument. But the reality is, guys, why is this happening? Because we're seeing the impact. We're seeing the impact of sins, the sin of men, the, the lasting consequences of the sins that, that our fathers have committed. That's what we're dealing with in our community, with our kids. Our failure to lead our homes, our failure to lead our churches, our failure to lead our community. And that's what we're seeing. And I believe that we're seeing just the beginning. Thank God he did not do 
what he said that he was going to do. And you know what the sad thing is? You think all the other kids on this Instagram post would say, dude, you're crazy. You're outside your mind. No. What were they doing? Hey, man, you know what? That's too tough. Don't, don't use guns. Just blow up the school. Use a bomb. Really? Guys, <laughs> these are our kids. Welcome to social media, 2014. But do you ever check, do you ever check your kids' social media? Do you know what your kid's doing at school? God makes good on his promises. God makes good on his promises to bless and his promise to punish. If not now, in eternity. In other words, God is a God of integrity. Amen? He's a man or a God. He's a God of his word. He is who he says he is. In Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, the Bible says, And the Lord God and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God is merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquities and transgressions of sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquities of the Father upon the children and the children's children to the third and to the fourth generations. Write that one down. We need someone to save us. From what? From God's wrath. From God's judgment. We must be careful about choosing leaders from among sinful men. It doesn't take much for good leadership to become very bad leadership. Be careful who we follow. Now, we won't find perfect leaders, okay? We won't find perfect leaders, but we need faithful ones. We need ones that love God, ones that put God first. And you know what? If they're going to make a mistake, they're going to make a mistake going full force, trying to do the right thing. It'd be like a baseball player trying to dive for that pop fly and missing it, but at least they don't. It'd be like that shortstop trying to make a dive of a ground ball and missing it, but laying it all out there. For righteousness and for good. We should support and encourage good biblical leadership. And we need to pray for their protection. But we should reject, condemn, and pray for, for those that are, are not uh, leading in a biblical way. Who only want to destroy. And finally, God has something to say to followers and those who are leaders. You might be a parent... You might be a boss. You might be a pastor. Any type of leader or whatever it may be, we should ask ourselves how, how we are Abimelechs. How we can be Abimelechs. Because every single one of us can easily become an Abimelech. We all want to be great. Whether we admit it or not. And much like greed this sin is hard to see. So very few of us will ever admit it. Just as there is always someone richer, living more lavish than us, there is always someone more prideful. There is always someone more powerful. There is always someone more stronger. And be careful who you pick on. They may look small, but they may be a black belt. <laughs> and they may be a female. I'm telling you, I was uh, talking to a guy and he's taking karate, right? He says, man, I, what I've learned about this is be careful who you, you know, who you pick on. One of the things my dad always told me, be careful because you never know. They may take you out. And you could watch UFC, you can watch boxing. You know, there's always somebody stronger out there. And they may not be stronger, but it just may be their day and not yours. <laughs> it is, you may slip, you may, whatever it may be, and that is it. Be careful. There is always someone more prideful and more about their own greatness than us that are willing to, to do whatever it takes, you know, or at whatever cost to take you out. 
And it doesn't just happen on the streets. It happens in corporate America. It happens in the school district. It happens, you know, uh, political arena. It happens. If you want to be known, if you want to struggle with sinful ambitions, ask two questions. If you want to know if you're struggling with, with uh, sinful ambitions, ask two questions. The first one, how do you look at people who are powerful and more successful than you? How do you look at them? Do you feel inferior and covet them? Do you feel superior and criticize them? You struggle with sinful ambition. Second, how do you look at people who are powerless and less successful than you? Do you feel superior and pity them? Do you respect and love them? Jesus' own disciples struggled with wanting to be great. And here is what he told them in Matthew chapter 20. Turn there with me. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 to 26, the Bible says, and it's up on the screen, but Jesus called them to himself and said, You guys are still going? Okay, I'll wait. Matthew chapter 20. It says, But Jesus called to, them, to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. Let's read together. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Oh, why did you guys all just deserve it? <laughs> Not me, right? I don't want to be, be a servant. I was teaching the Summit High School football team today about 3 o'clock. And there are some awesome teachers there that they're female teachers and they love these kids and they look at them as their sons and so we bring, you know, the pizza to the guys and everybody's just, you know, all these guys just kind of get all up and everybody tries to rush the table, you know, and, and these teachers, they serve these guys and, and you know, um, it's amazing sometimes how they disrespect these teachers and the things that they say to them because they love, these teachers love God and, and they love these kids and they're willing to, you know, to do anything, they have a mother's heart for them and literally, you know, I had I heard one of the, the one of the guys, and he wasn't a football player, but he was one of the guys that just came in. He's like, he called out to the teacher. He's like, "Can you serve me? Can you, you know, like, like, dude, are you serious, bro?" So when the teacher walked out, the coach got up there and and he, you know he put on his coach kind of attitude, and he says, um, "You guys better respect this girl, respect these teachers." Don't disrespect them because they love you. Don't take advantage of them because they love you. These girls, they serve you, and, you, and, and, you, and I'm, I'm hearing you guys disrespect them. Just because they love you, don't give you the right to disrespect them. Just because they serve you. And the kids were like, sorry, coach. And it's true. When you look at the, the coordinators and the leadership of the church, guys, we are here to wash your feet. You know what I mean? Straight out. Take the toe jam out. All that stuff. That's what we do. That's what we do. We don't do it because you know, we want any position. We do it because we love you. Because that's what Jesus calls us to do. But does it mean that you disrespect and you abuse and you step on? John chapter 13. Verses 1. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover... When Jesus knew his hour had come, that he should depart from the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And, and supper and, uh, uh, and super uh, being ended, I'm sorry, supper being ended, the devil having already put into the, the hearts of Judas Iscariot, Simon the son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given up all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going to, going to God, 
rose from supper and laid aside his garment, took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a, a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he had girded, which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my, my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing, what I, what I am doing, you do not understand. But you will you will know after this. And Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And and Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands in my head. And Jesus said to him, Who uh, he who is base needs only to wash his, his feet, but but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garment, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? Let's read this together. Verse 13. You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Amen. Guys, we are servants. We are to serve one another. It's not just my job. It's all of our job. We need to take pride in ownership of the church God has given us. If you see a piece of trash, pick it up. If you see tables that need to be picked up, pick it up. It's all of our responsibility in our community. It's all of our responsibility to take ownership. Why? Because we are here to serve. If you want to be great, then we need to strive to be a servant, not a leader. You serve, you make much of others, you consider them more important than yourself. This is only possible, how? Through faith in Jesus Christ. Only through the love of Christ. Not in my flesh. My flesh doesn't want to serve anybody. My flesh wants to what? Be served. served. My flesh wants to go sit on my lazy boy, kick it up, give me a cup of coffee, and enjoy the show. And by the way, can you bring me some ice cream too? (laughs) Somebody said that game, what? But you know that never happens. It doesn't, honestly. I mean, actually I do get served, I'm not gonna lie. Um, But we serve each other. (laughs) The gospel tells us that Jesus was and is the Lord of all. He was more powerful, more worthy, deserving than any, yet he served. He didn't come, you know, he he came not to be served, but he came to serve and to offer his life a ransom for many. He did not take his rightful throne by force, but was lifted up through the cross, you know, on on Calvary. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11, the Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery, what? being equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, what did he do? He humbled himself and he became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, God has then also has highly exalted him and giving him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus Christ, can we say this together, every knee is about of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord. Is what? Lord. To the glory of God forever. Amen. He humbled himself. And out of love. Ephesians 2 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. The Bible says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that's not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any one should boast. You see, it is only through Jesus Christ, it is only through faith, it's only through 
his spirit that we can, we can exercise this type of love, this type of humility, because it's not natural in us. It's only through Jesus Christ. Through faith, I become truly satisfied with what Jesus has given to me, that he has made me strong, that he knows my name, that he died for me, that he counts me worthy. And I, like I told the guys today, I said, listen, man, you know, we're not here because we like to, you know, serve you guys. I go, we're here because we serve Jesus Christ. And in that, we serve you. Don't take advantage of the Lord. Because in high school, I wouldn't be serving you, bro. I'd have remind those football players. In high school, <laughs> We would, I would not be serving you. If I didn't have Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I would not be serving you. But because I have him in my heart, guess what? I can serve you. Because I know who I am in Christ. I can humble myself. I don't need to be lifted up. He needs to be lifted up. I must decrease that he might increase. Amen? I don't need to have the last word. I don't need to always be right. I am satisfied. Why? Because I've been set free from jealousy. I'm not threatened anymore. I don't need to be like an Abimelech. If God has chosen to make you great, the cross should restrain you from boasting. Amen? You may have some great positions in this community, but your boasting should be in the Lord. If you aren't or you've never experienced greatness, the resurrection also tells you that you will inherit eternity. And let's close up by reading 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And it's going to be up here for sake of time. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 31. The Bible says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised. God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Why? that no flesh should glory in his presence. No flesh. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification. How? And redemption. That as it is written, he who glories, let's read it together, let him glory in the Lord. Amen? Amen? To God be the glory. Let us pray. Father, Lord, I want to ask forgiveness for any, any, Lord, I know as pastor, Lord, there is no room for man. And Lord, even as I read your word, I contaminate it because I am flesh. Lord, I, I ask for forgiveness, Lord, if, if any of my flesh is, is not in the way of your glory. Lord, I pray for the body of Christ right now. Lord, as we looked at Abimelech's wife, Lord, it almost reminds me of, even as we think about Star Wars, and Luke looked at Darth Vader, he saw his picture in that, that helmet as it was cut open. Lord, and often, the things that we don't want to be, we become. The things that we hate the most, we become, if we're not careful, Lord. Even as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, maybe you're here today, and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, You've become what you never thought you wanted to be. The Lord wants to meet you here. Whether it's pride, whether it's just bad leadership, bad decisions, whether it's taking any kind of glory from God, right now, we must humble ourselves before the throne of God. We must ask God for forgiveness because we all want to be great. But there's only one who is worthy to be praised to be worshipped. And it's not the guys that we, or the girls that are, you know, on the TV, you know, that we idol so often. 
No, it's the Lord. He's the only one who died for our sins. He's the only one who rose from the dead. He's the only one who is worthy of our praise. And maybe you've been praising others. Maybe you've been putting your trust in men. And you know, it's time to repent and say, you know, Lord, forgive me because I've failed, Lord, and I've allowed others to fulfill your role in my heart. Maybe you're single here and you're, you're looking for a man to fill that void or for a woman to fill that void. God says, no, I, I, I'm here for you. I, I'm your husband. I love you. You seek me first. I will fill those areas of your life. And you're here today and you need prayer. And God is speaking to you right now. He's knocking at the door of your heart. I want to pray for you that you can make a mental God and you can you know, say, Lord, forgive me for allowing that person to take your place, for allowing you know, that, that job to take your place, for allowing anything else to take his place. Because one day we're going to stand before him, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. And I ask and I beg of you to humble yourself right now. Humble yourself that he may lift you up. The eyes closed and your heads bowed. If you're here and you need prayer and you've put up other things before God and you put others before God, May it not be a millstone to fall on your head for you to realize that. May you acknowledge His Spirit right now, speaking to you right now. And if you need prayer and you want to make amends and you want to ask God to forgive you, and you want to make Him the Lord of your life right now, may you raise your hands with me. We can pray for you right now. Amen. I see your hand. Amen. Between you and God, we're just going to sing. Amen. I see your hand. Amen. You know, there's all kinds of things that come in our way. Careers colleges, all kinds of things. The enemy just puts them there to distract us. And they want that throne. And we need to dethrone those things. We need to put Christ back on the throne. Even churches. Anybody else before we pray? Amen. I see your hand. Amen. Amen. Hobbies. Anything else? God says, no. That's my throne. I am the only one worthy. Anybody else? I mean, do you know we can even put our marriages before God? You know we can even put our kids before God? Got to be very careful. Let me just pray for you guys. Father, you see the hands of your children. You see the hearts of your people. Lord, I, I, I pray, Lord, that you forgive us. Father, because, Lord, even as a, a country, Lord, we're turning our eyes Lord, from you. But for you guys that have raised your hands and, and you want to ask God to forgive you, I'm going to lead you in a prayer of repentance because God wants to forgive you tonight. But you have a free will to make that choice, to put him on that throne. Repeat after me, dear Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sin. Wash me, cleanse me. Give me a new life. And help me to follow you from this day forward. I dethrone the world. And I put you on the throne of my heart today. To be my Lord. To be my God. To be my Savior. Above all, before a career, before a relationship, before all, Thank you for dying on the cross for me. And thank you for rising from the dead for me. Be my God, be my Lord, and be my Savior. In the name of Jesus Christ, all God's children said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. If you said that prayer, if you said that prayer, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Amen. So how do you keep the Lord of your life? Guys, I want to encourage you. Plug in the church. Keep coming. Read your Bible if you need one. We have one in the back. Pray and go and share and fellowship. Stay connected. Amen. All right. And and your your NFL teams, be them. That's why people say, Pastor, who do you like? I said, I like them all. Come on, man. Take a side. Well, Jesus Christ. I mean, what? You know, somebody in my heart, somebody on my chest, Jesus in my heart. I mean, what do you want me to say? I mean, that's just how it is, guys. You know what I mean? So may we always keep Jesus number one in our heart. Amen. The standard words for the Lord. God bless you. Have a great night.